Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crossing Latinidades Climate Pilot Symposium. My name is Jorge, and I am the Associate Director at the Latino Cultural Center. I will help facilitate today's agenda uh, to ensure that we make best use of our time together today. Before we get started, there's a couple of Zoom keeping items I would like to mention. Um, let's do a quick access check. Please let us know if our audio is okay with a thumbs up reaction um, or just a nod. Um, if you would, should you be, uh, you should be able to access the live caption option on Zoom by clicking the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and selecting show subtitle. If you have any questions about accessibility during our program, please message us and we'll guide you through that process. Secondly, please make sure you sign in by clicking the link that will be provided in the chat. We also want to remind attendees that this symposium is being recorded. Um, as we engage today, please be mindful of our virtual space. You of course are welcome to use the chat for questions and comments. Please know that all questions and comments will be collected from the chat and answered at a later time. So that uh, again, we make best use of our time. Um, you're also welcome to send any questions you may have to Wilmarie Medina Cortez, whose email will be shared in the chat as well. Uh, Wilmarie has been in the background doing much of the logistics uh, work for today's event. And she will ensure that all questions are answered in the upcoming days as well. Now to open the symposium, uh, we would like to begin today by acknowledging that the University of Illinois at Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. The area was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 100,000 tribal members within the Chicagoland area being home up uh, with the Chicago the land area being home um, for one of the largest and more, more diverse urban native communities in the United States. Through this land acknowledgement, we recognize that the indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. As we work, live, play, learn on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonization and state violence and support indigenous communities struggles for self-determination and sovereignty. Um, now to today's climate pilot symposium. Um, this pilot symposium is led by the climate pilot cohort, which has come together by a common concern for the ways climate change is rapidly and devastatingly affecting Latinx, Latin American and Caribbean communities. Throughout our time together this morning and, and this afternoon, um, researchers, educators, activists, and poets will be featured through short presentations and performances with the larger goal um, of building a focus on climate change and to initiate collaborative work across Latino studies and other disciplines in participating universities. During this time together, uh, an artist from Ink Factory is also joining us and they will create live visual notes uh, Allison will be synthesizing our words into images and text to visually represent the key concepts and themes of our conversation. And we will have an opportunity to engage with her illustration boards later today. To tell us a little bit more about Crossing Latinidades, I will hand over the virtual mic to Dr. Maria de Los, de Los Angeles Torres, or as we affectionately know her, Nena, co-PI of Crossing Latinidades and professor of Latin American and Latino studies. Nena, you are currently muted. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Um, este, thank you, um, Jorge, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I am the co-PI, as Jorge was saying, with Amalia Payares, and actually with our chancellor, of uh, a small Mellon grant um, that uh, was given to UIC with the idea of bringing together all the universities that are R1 and Hispanic serving institutions. Um, we have been playing around with this idea for some time, given that we are uniquely situated, not only in terms of our student body, uh, but of the many institutions that we have on our campuses, 
perhaps we know not enough and not deep enough or broad enough, uh, but um, clearly institutions that are involved with uh, teaching, uh, research, archiving, uh, and performing and um, programming um, Latino studies and Latino cultural events. Um, so the idea of the grant was to launch this consortium and this has been done. Um, our chancellors met, as many of you know, uh, in the fall and we also had breakout rooms with all the directors of all these various programs on campuses um, to start planning what it is that we could do collaboratively um, as, as a consortium. And there have been meetings uh, um, in terms of research collaborations, teaching collaborations, cultural centers, archives, and something that cuts across all these various areas is the pipeline. That is not only from undergraduate to graduate, but graduate to professoriate. And given that, again, we are uniquely situated um, given the R1 uh, status and the emphasis on, on research. In addition, uh, Mellon with their very small grant uh, wanted us to also show that we could work together uh, along the lines uh, of research or teaching. And as such, um, the, there are three pilot groups that have been launched. The climate change is one of them. The other is uh, around poetry, both the creation and the teaching of poetry to dual and sometimes um, uh, multiple uh, uh, language students. Uh, and uh, also a uh, teaching heritage, uh, teaching Spanish to heritage students. Um, this is the pilot group, uh, the climate, as you know, has been working for several months and this is the launching event. Um, the, the purpose I think that's very important for us to keep in mind is that this consortium will have a lot of legs to it, okay? There will be, I mean, there's potentials in terms of medical schools coming together, uh, legal clinics throughout, uh, uh, all sorts of different kinds of potential. But Crossing Latinidades, the one that is that we want to anchor, uh, is basically about moving the field of Latino studies. I mean, it is an intellectual project that one takes into account the history of Latino studies in that we know it comes from single nationalities and also single localities. These localities also grew bridges um, to uh, 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 home countries, uh, but we've never really had a very robust um, set of structures that allowed us to basically do comparative work in Latino studies. We're hoping that throughout um, the work and the collaborations that are done, that this comparative study can move the field forward. All right, so there is that intellectual project. Um, we also, uh, because it's Mellon and because it's Latino studies, the emphasis here is humanities, uh, and, but humanities broadly speaking, Latino studies is an interdisciplinary field uh, that both not only looks at social science, but also at humanities, but most importantly, the methods that we use tend to be more based in humanities as opposed to, you know, uh, some of the um, other uh, quantitative social sciences. Um, we're obviously, we are public universities uh, to date. Uh, there are no uh, R1 privates that are also HSIs um, serving. Uh, and so I think that there is a certain responsibility and again, opportunity that we have to be able to create knowledge that is responsive to our community's needs and to, uh, and to the public in general. So we're very excited about the work that um, the climate change group uh, is doing. Um, we hope that this is a very productive day. Um, our steps going forward will be to, we are waiting to see if Mellon will invite us uh, to do a larger grant. Um, we are one step closer to that in that we have invited, we have been invited to uh, produce a concept paper. Uh, basically around, um, you know, research and graduate education, which is what they're seeing as the real potential here. Of course, there will be um, uh, lots of room for development of other projects as well. So um, I hope you have a very productive day and um, look forward to seeing the results of all your discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Torres. Up next, uh, Dr. Levi Romero.
inaugural New Mexico Poet Laureate and Professor of Chicana and Chicano Studies at the University of New Mexico will share a poem with us. Santos y buenos días les de Dios de Nuevo México. Saludes, saludes a todos y todas. Thank you for inviting me to open up today with a, with a poem. Um, in New Mexico, really, our traditions, our culture, our memories, our history, our antepasados are all connected still to the present. And as we consider the future, this these two poems here is really a, it, it's a diptych really of bringing those uh, voices of the landscape together in the present, uh, in the moment, and looking at the past too as a place of refuge, a lugar sagrado, something that nurtures us, something that makes us feel safe, a place where we feel at home. Destinations. Tonight, the stars are bright and plentiful. And with our necks craning up toward the sky, we stand attempting to identify the constellations and trying to distinguish the satellites from the jets and the stars. I planted the last of the garden today. Chile, alverjón, cebolla, rabanitos. Several days ago, it was the maíz, melones, sandías, calabacitas. A warm breeze is blowing across the orchard. There has been mention of ghosts and spirits of relatives who come to visit, that they move through the fields stooped over like Burma grass in the wind. Las grullas will fly over the village tomorrow, northward, their long necks piercing the sky. Years after my father died and his body was laid into the earth, his garden continued to yield vegetables, radishes and carrots burrowed into the dark moist dirt and the onion stalks stood straight as the soldier standing for the 21 gun salute. Yesterday morning crickets purred under the shade of the last broad green leaf plant in the yard while insects flicked under a canopy of morning glories. Last time I saw you, we spoke of conflict and that all endings must have resolution. This afternoon, I long for the voice of the red-breasted robin. I yearn for the slow sinking rhythm of a long summer evening and good conversation. A thin thread of web glistens in the crook of the plum tree. I am accompanied only by the caw and swooping flight of the crow across the afternoon sky. The sunflowers in the meadow are crowned with halos of petals brown and golden in the haze of autumn sunlight, crouched and looking like old men with wrinkled faces, their reach towards the sun, frozen in a final grasp towards warmth and light. Buenos dias. Beautiful. Thank you for your words, Dr. Levi Romero. May we all reach towards the sun. Um, up next, Dr. Ra Ralph Sintron, Interim Director of LALS and Professor of English, will share the details about the Climate Pilot Cohort and what is next in our agenda. Yes, uh, thank you, Levi. Um, thank you, uh, Nena. Thank you, Jorge, for getting us started. Um, so uh, the climate uh, group um, at UIC started working on this quite some time ago, uh, back in the last semester, back in the fall. And then we started reaching out, as some of you know, we started reaching out to different universities. We located folks um, at different universities who were doing climate work. Um, and then I think in December, so December, January, uh, we started contacting everybody. Um, so we've been thinking about this for some time. Uh, we've been thinking about it collectively. Uh, and all of a sudden we're, we're finally here together collectively. 
And so I, this is, um, for me at least, this is really, I, I hope this will be a kind of eye-opening moment where we hear what is happening from the different, uh, where, what is happening uh, at the different universities around matters of climate change, and also how those folks uh, see this intersecting with Latino studies. Um, so we all know that Latino studies, uh, as Nena uh, explained, I think quite well, Latino studies historically has been separated uh, in different regions. They've kind of conducted their own kind of work. Um, but we haven't necessarily brought all of the different factions together. Uh, and I think that's the excitement that we're all kind of anticipating. Uh, so how is it that the University of Central Florida can be talking to the University of Arizona, can be talking to uh, UIC, talking to El Paso, talking to Arlington and so on. So that's our larger goal. Can we stimulate this uh, conversation? Um, can we see where Latino studies uh, might begin to take on a, a, a new focus, quite frankly? Um, Latino studies, generally speaking, has been uh, at times looking at this sort of work, but it's been looking at the work individually. Um, but this is the first time that we can suddenly see the possibility of literally bringing different universities into conversation with each other. And then to see, you know, are there, are there sorts of grants that we might go after further down the line? Um, I would like to emphasize the word that um, Nena, uh, I think, used uh, knowledge, knowledge making, uh, a different kind of interdisciplinarity, uh, it seems to me, located within communities. Um, so um, the next thing that we'll be doing, we'll be hearing from the different specific cohorts, uh, University of Arizona, University of Texas Arlington, University of Central Florida, University of New Mexico, University of Texas at El Paso, UIC, et cetera. Uh, and they'll, they're getting ready now to tell us uh, the sort of work that they're doing. So I guess, do I turn it over to you, Jorge? That is Perfect. Um, yes, well, Marie will be the one to share our, the PowerPoint and get us started. Thank you all. Thank you, Jorge. So I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here and I'll just introduce everyone um, as we go through the presentations um, and <clears throat> introduce the universities as they move along. So uh, can everyone see my screen? Wonderful. Um, so uh, here is our list of uh, universities presenting today and part of the symposium. So first up to present is uh, Dr. Adriana Zuninga from the University of Arizona. Thank you for going first. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm very happy to be included in, in this project. Um, it's lovely to meet you, Ralph, Will Marie, Rosa. We've been emailing for, for quite some time, so it's great to, to finally see you, at least virtually. So I'm uh, Adriana Zuniga from the University of Arizona, and, um, you know, I teach uh, sustainability courses, uh, planning courses, so undergraduate, graduate students, and I try to involve them in my projects. Uh, I study uh, urban resilience. I'm a, a background in architecture, PhD in in environmental sciences. So I look at cities and how cities are, are adapting to climate change, urban resilience. But I have, a, I look at, at these issues or questions through an environmental justice perspective. And um, in this sense, um, Latinx um, communities are the, the um, adversely affected and disproportionately affected. So I look at green infrastructure or vegetation, green space, parks, everything that has vegetation in cities because it helps us reduce heat and flooding, which are the, the main uh, impacts of climate change in, the, in, in this region of the United States, in, in Arizona and the Southwestern region in general. So uh, in this um, first slide, um, I'm introducing a case study of Tucson where we have been working with different pots of money over several years to do community engagement around green infrastructure. And I'm showing you some maps around 
tree canopy cover on the left, you see that the, I'm signaling in a circle, the, um, uh, the south side of the city is visibly less vegetated and consequently it experiences higher heat and you in, in other places of the United States might not see this very relevant, but in Arizona, heat is really, really harsh. We experience triple digits. So it makes a huge difference uh, vegetation in terms of how many degrees, sometimes even eight or seven degrees Fahrenheit hotter with, with the absence of vegetation. And this lack of vegetation also represents um, higher risk of flooding. Uh, everything is paved, so you know that the water cycle does not happen and so on. So we work with partners and here are some logos of, the, of some partners, local organization, governmental, com grassroots organization to, to see how we can make this greening happen because just planting trees is, is not enough because they die if, if people on the ground do not take care of them. So they, we need community buying, we need all these to make this happen. So this is kind of the projects we have been working on. Uh, Wilmarie, can you change the slide, please? <clears throat> so as I was saying, I have a lot of students and we've uh, realized that uh, the youth, the students are like a golden resource uh, for these engagement projects. They are really energetic and passionate and enthusiastic. They love to do something about climate change, not just learning the depressing facts that the world is changing, but what can they do about it? And, and planting trees is an easy and hopeful and, and beautiful thing that everyone really is excited. And we also um, bring art into these projects like this student that I'm showing you here from from a local school in the south side of Tucson where it's uh, really, that's the only tree where she's standing, right? The, the rest of the, the school is, is barren. Uh, so we created this seating space be, below this uh, shade uh, made of straw bell benches and, and the students in the high school um, designed the art that would cover those um, benches through mosaic. So they were engaged through art not only tree planting, but also building straw bell benches, some sustainable um, architecture going on there. And then implementation projects, bringing volunteers, um, you know, neighbors, the, this community at the school and my students uh, leading this effort through a youth mo mentoring model. So I will be supervising grad students who will be supervising undergrads who will be doing a, a, you know, a club, a UA a, a student club with the high school students in this area. So this youth mentoring model seems to be working really well. Um, can you change the slide, Will Marie? And I'm, that, this is my last slide. Uh, we are replicating this project in Ambos Nogales, which is our border with the Mexico, US-Mexico border is Ambos Nogales. And we know working with schools is a great way to engage with the community. So we are replicating what we learned. Uh, we're working with a middle school and I'm showing you here one uh, in Nogales, Sonora, um, the middle school, a public middle school that is barren with no vegetation. And we know art works. So we, are create, we created a contest, a drawing contest. And there you see hanging like, line, uh, like clothes, all the, um, the drawings that the middle school students created to what, happened when it, what happens in your city when it rains. And you can see they stay home because the, the city floods and actually people die um, all the time in Nogales because of flash floods. It's quite, quite tragic. So we, we sensitize the, the community through art. And then we introduce the concepts of green infrastructure to get their buying. We bring landscape architecture students who create a, a design for the school and you can see how it works, uh, the design over there. And then we do a demonstration project of actually planting trees and, and so forth. We also work with community partners on the ground with uh, governmental, non-governmental, academic, and so forth. So that's the model. That's what, what we are working, addressing climate on Latinx communities on this side of, of the country. And thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you for showing us what community engagement can look like uh, when 
addressing some of these issues. Um, next up, we have uh, two presentations from the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, first up will be uh, Christian Zol Zolniski, apologies if I, I messed that up, and Adri Ariadna Reyes-Sanchez. Hola, uh, buenos días o buenas tardes, dependiendo de donde estén. Uh, <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for um, inviting us for, uh, to this uh, symposium. Uh, we are very excited to be part of this uh, initiative and, you know, from uh, early on because we, and I, I feel that it has a lot of uh, potential. So, uh, you know, this, this is great. And, and I, I want to thank to uh, Maria de Los Angeles Torres, Ralph and everybody who has been putting this uh, together and, and William Marie as, as well. Um, so I'm a, a professor for uh, anthropology at uh, UT Arlington, and I also uh, am the director of the Center for uh, Mexican American Studies. And um, my work, you know, I've been trained as an anthropologist and my work has mostly been on transnational migration and labor um, across the border and, and mostly in, uh, Northern Mexico. So what I want to present today is a, a new project that um, I just, uh, I have started uh, over the past uh, couple of year, years that has to do with the extraction of um, uh, beach pebbles uh, from Northern Mexico in Baja California that are increasingly used uh, here in the US partially to address the uh, effects of uh, climate change. So um, if we could, uh, Move to the first slide, please. Uh, this is the location uh, of the, I do my work in the so-called San Quintin Valley and um, the Valle de San Quintin, that is for those of you who are probably you haven't heard about it, but it's an, an agro-export enclave that produce fresh fruits and veggies for export markets is, is, is the model of export agriculture and uh, a lot of our tomatoes and berries that we consume uh, here come from uh, this um, uh, enclave. And I've been doing work on that uh, in that region for many years. And uh, what I, after that, I discovered a, a new emerging industry, which uh, has to do with uh, the extract, extraction and commercialization of beach pebbles. In, the, uh, in that region. Um, this uh, is located about, about 300 kilometers from the um, US and Mexico, uh, Mexico's border. And thus my work here brings uh, a transnational connection or dimension that, that I want to emphasize. If we could uh, move to the next slide, please. So, uh, the, the work is focused on on an, an occupation and an industry that um, has been operating in the region uh, for a long time, but that has intensified dramatically since the early 2000s. And uh, it's basically, like I said, the collection by hand of uh, beach pebbles of different size and colors that are later exported uh, to the US. Uh, most of the labor that is employed here uh, are indigenous workers that come from uh, some of the poorest regions in southern Mexico, states like uh, Guerrero, Oaxaca, Puebla, and uh, most likely Chiapas, and who have uh, settled down in the region. Some of them are farm workers and combine that uh, work with, uh, with this other occupation, or they are full-time employed here. But this is a very labor-intensive um, job and is basically operates in the informal economy. Uh, the companies that um, extract the pebbles have to have a license by the Mexican government, but the labor is all its employee under the, <laughs> under the radar in the formal, um, in, in the informal uh, sector. Uh, can, and so this is a picture of you know, one of the summers that I, a couple of summers ago, and how it's, you know, it's a very in, intense extraction uh, of the beach pebbles along the coast. Can we move to the next one? So uh, what at first glance might appear as um, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, something that is small in 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 in, in scope, uh, the collection and and recollection of these uh, uh, pebbles or an artisan um, job is actually part of a much larger transnational commodity chain. And that's what I kind of try to show in my uh, work, because these beach pebbles, just like the fruits and vegetables that are produced in the region, are related ship to the US um, through, the, um, through the border, um, you know, first in this, um, uh, these trucks. And they go in huge volumes later throughout the, uh, the, the country. And one of the things that I'm looking at is the uh, not just the labor, but also the ecological impact that these um, intensive labor uh, extractive activities have in the local communities where these workers uh, live, including erosion uh, along the, the, the coast. To put this in perspective, the U.S. is a net importer of uh, beach pebbles from different parts of the of the world. The sending um, can be, be uh, lead sending countries include Canada, Mexico, New Zealand, and, and Peru. And the volume that we ex import uh, beach pebbles from um, abroad have um, expanded, increased about two by two hundred and seventy percent since the early 2000 to 2015. Um, can you please uh, move to the next one? Um, now, where are the major US destinations? Uh, they are basically in California, New York, Florida, Texas, uh, and Arizona. And um, you can find them in large change um, stores like the Home Depots and, and Lowe's. They are market here in the US as uh, Mexican beach pebbles, and also in small retail stores. And they are used for um, landscape and commercial and residential projects, as well as beautification projects in, in, in other places. But often they go to you know, high-end um, uh, uh, homes or of, uh, uh, and, and, and swimming pools and to beautification of uh, landscape uh, residential uh, and projects, and they are increasingly used to address, um, you know, the, the cost of water and to uh, replace loans by so-called more uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, materials, uh, often without realizing what are the labor and ecological impacts on the local communities from which um, these um, materials are being um, uh, extracted. So the uh, project that I've been um, that I uh, engage now is looking at the labor arrangements that predominate in this uh, transnational um, industry, uh, the transnational connect connections that uh, connect these huge uh, chains like Home Depot with the indigenous workers that are collecting those uh, uh, pebbles, um, the impacts on the local communities and the different uses uh, for which uh, they are, you know, these pebbles are um, are, are employed in, um, in in the U.S. again in both uh, commercial and residential um, uh, purposes. So uh, what I try to uh, do is look at um, approach this project as an example of. Um, the uh, transnational ramifications of climate change and how that um, is impacting the uh, work lives of uh, indigenous workers in uh, northern uh, Mexico and their uh, local communities. Um, so that is what I have to, uh, to share again. Thank you for, uh, for the kind invitation and I look forward to learn what everybody else is uh, doing within this um, pilot group. Thank you. Hello. I go ahead. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ariadna Reyes Sanchez, and I'll talk about sustainability, water, urban informality in the Dallas Forward Metroplex. I'm an assistant professor of planning at UT Arlington. Um, can you? Um, 
So my research provides a different perspective to the analysis of climate change mitigation and just sustainability in informal communities in Latin America. For over a decade, I've been studying the characteristics of buildings, a community infrastructure, and the extent of water energy and energy use in informal communities in Mexico and the Dominican Republic. So this is a picture of those platanitos in Santo Domingo. And so I do this work because governments in Latin America still have very negative perceptions of people in informal communities. And instead of supporting policies that improve the conditions of informal communities in Latin America, they seek to, to construct new affordable housing. And then so uh, my research uh, illuminates the many different environmental injustices that people in informal communities face, such as the lack of sanitation and solid waste uh, collection uh, systems, as I'm showing in Los Platanitos, but also illuminate the sustainable and innovative solutions that families enact to address environmental injustices related to water and infrastructure. So my research in Latin America made me aware uh, of the urgent need to include informal communities in the scope of climate justice, just sustainability and environmental um, research, uh, just because despite the fact that people in informal communities of Asia and Latin America have improved the quality of buildings uh, and community infrastructure in informal communities, still 25% of the world's population live in a community that may be considered informal or pejoratively called slum. Uh, and more importantly, 90% of urban growth is gonna take place in the poorest regions of the planet. And then so figures of informality are expected to grow in the decades to come. Um, can you please? And then in the US, there is a very poor understanding of urban informality, water challenges and environmental justice, just because the US government and planning literature and sustainability literature doesn't recognize it as an issue of the US. And it has been seen as an issue of Texas and the US-Mexico border. And then so new research has shown that this is a national phenomenon and that many uh, informal subdivisions of land uh, resided by Latinos and people of color with low income backgrounds are emerging in the outskirts of US cities, not beyond Texas, but also across the nation. And then, so, because there is a very limited data, uh, my research on urban informality, which is new and draws on my previous experiences in Mexico. In Mexico, uh, you know, a requirement to do a mixed method approach to understand the characteristics of buildings, water systems, the extent of water and energy consumption in informal communities uh, that are called in the US colonias uh, because they resemble the characteristics of informal communities in Mexico. Um, and then, so I'm going to be conducting a uh, field work in Dallas Forward, a uh, metroplex that have numerous uh, colonias. Uh, the next one. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, conducting extensive field work in these communities using ethnogra ethnographic approaches, conducting field works, uh, works um, intensive case studies that allow me to understand the characteristics of buildings and, and water systems, and that allow us to understand the potential of sustainable upgrading solutions that help people improve their living conditions, access to running water and safe sanitation systems, reduce vulnerabilities to floods, which are disproportionately exposed to, and support sustainable communities. Uh, and so in doing so, kind of my research in Mexico, in the Dominican Republic and in Texas may serve us to understand the potential of urban informality as a mechanism for improving the living conditions of families. And then perhaps climate policy help us 
address these inequities faster so people can live in a truly sustainable community. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to both of you. So, so much good information. Um, we'll move on to the next group. Um, so we have the University of Central Florida presenting. So that is Sergio Alvarez, Jacopo Baggio, Luis Santiago, and Fernando Rivera. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Fernando, are you, please go ahead. No, I just, uh, basically, this is our team uh, uh, and sort of the presentation will go, uh, we'll, as I uh, said here, we'll go kind of like in that order, uh, just switching around, but tell you a little bit about what we think in terms of these issues of climate change and then some of the initiatives that were taking place. So I will ask uh, my team members to, you know, please uh, identify your background uh, when you start the presentation. So sir, here, go ahead and begin. Thank you. So. Uh if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so again, uh, my name is Sergio Alvarez. I am an economist by training. And uh, right now I am a assistant professor uh, in the School of Tourism that we have down here in Orlando, Florida. Um, and um, be, you know, besides that, we also have uh, here at UCF, we have a, a Center for Integrated Coastal Studies that began as a faculty cluster initiative. So. Uh, actually, myself and Jacopo are both uh, relatively new hires uh, of this initiative, um, but we also work with engineers, with biologists, with other biophysical scientists uh, to try to address uh, issues centered around uh, coastal uh, development, um, you know, ecosystem health, these kinds of things. So um, really to us, um, maybe speaking just from myself and Jacopo's perspective, uh, we essentially work with people every day who see climate change as uh, entirely as a science issue. So they want to study the effect of uh, the greenhouse effect, for example, on uh, the tides and on sea level rise. They want to study the effect of uh, the greenhouse effect or how the greenhouse effect is impacting biodiversity, fisheries, forests, those kinds of things. Um, but what uh, myself and Jacopo are trying to do is to bring uh, a different perspective um, to, to the conversation in which humans are at the center of the conversation. Uh, we see humans as being the causal agents of anthropogenic climate change, obviously. Uh, and really, we are also um, experiencing the impacts of uh, anthropogenic climate change. So to try to study climate change uh, without considering humans and human agency, we think is, uh, is, is a fallacy. Um, so some of the things that we talk about are, number one, the need for collective action and the importance of collective action, particularly in climate change. So for instance, I could uh, become, you know, put solar panels in my roof, buy an electric vehicle, and my behavior and just my own behavior is not going to make a dent on the problem. Uh, so we need collective action, which requires policy, uh, the political process, um, working across uh, different nations. Um, so this is one of the things that we talk about. The other big point that we talk about is the interdependencies between the human systems and the, the rest of the system, the ecological systems and the biophysical systems, and how it is so important to understand those feedbacks. Both we are causing climate change and climate change is impacting us. Um, and then finally, and this is something that perhaps I have not done as much, is uh, looking beyond just this group of humans, looking at specific groups of, of individuals, at the, at the diverse population and how maybe these impacts are, um, you know, they are not uh, homogeneous across the entire population. Thank you. Jacopo. Oh, next uh, slide. Uh, thank you, Sergio, for, uh, for the introduction. And uh, my name is Jacopo Baggio. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs, as well as part of the National Center for Integrated Coastal Research at Sergio. Uh, I, my work is mainly to try to combine uh, multiple methods uh, to try to really understand collective actions and uh, the interdependencies that exist in these systems, no? because uh, we have seen before 
uh, not only there are interdependencies across systems, but there are also geographical and uh, political interdependencies that are very important to understand. But to do that, uh, we really need to take uh, a step back. And uh, here, I, I really like the idea of uh, including a lot more uh, of the arts and humanities that oftentimes might not be at the center of uh, what I work with uh, and combining the knowledge that comes from the art of humanities and the life histories of the people with uh, uh, potentially controlled experiments and formal models. And only by continuously feeding back and integrating different methods, we can really try to address complex problems. And one of the ideas uh, that uh, has that I bring back with, that I bring with me for quite some times, and I find it hard to actually implement. But this might be a great group to propose it: is to really use art and novels to assess not on to assess the evolution of how humans relate with the environment. Uh, and how humans view the environment and perceive it. And that's, I think, is very important, not only for la Latinx communities, but goes beyond that uh, uh, to really try to understand the history of these uh, uh, pathways. Uh, having said that, I would uh, you know these are the main approaches that we use or that we are trying to adopt uh, when tackling complex problems such as climate change. So the interdependencies of systems and the plurality of methods. And I think that Fernando and Luis will talk about specific projects that uh, try to somewhat implement uh, these approaches that uh, require obviously an interdisciplinary perspective and a multi methodological perspective. Thank you, Jacopo and next slides, please. Uh, so as you can see, you know, some of the issues of climate change is already displacing a lot of uh, populations, right? And one of the, the, the issues out here, especially in Florida, uh, you know, after Hurricane Maria, uh, Florida and Orlando specifically, Central Florida became the center of recovery out here. So now this is changing sort of the conversation, not only what happens where the disaster actually strikes, but what happen, uh, happens in receiving communities as well. So a, a big part of starting this Puerto Rico research hub that we have at the University of Florida was a result of what we saw after Hurricane Maria and sort of the displacement of people and people literally knocking on a door at our institution out here. So for that, just a, a brief outlook of the Puerto Rico research hub. And as you can see from that first graph, basically we do four things. So with the center of activities dedicated to the study of Puerto Ricans at the University of Central Florida. So we do academic research, but we also try to engage students in, in research projects out here. A big aspect is to do outreach, uh, basically what we learn from, from what we know, how we share that with that community and also the partnerships and partnerships with all members of society, uh, you know, from business groups to nonprofits to anybody that's interested out there. Uh, you know, in, in terms of, of that, we also have collaborated with the RICE Network and you can read from there, but this also arises in terms of, you know, how we're utilizing our universities when we have all this expertise, all this research and all these uh, students and community members and how do we utilize that uh, basically, you know, to respond to this crisis of climate change and, and other type of uh, climate related issues out here. So we're part of that conversation as well. And to wrap up, you know, well, I'm currently uh, leading a project in the Orlando area in combination with the Urban Institute. And this is part of the Gulf, uh, the National Academy of Sciences Gulf Research Program. And basically we're looking at the, the receiving communities out here. And in this case, uh, Puerto Rican victims of Hurricane Maria in Orlando. So basically looking at how were the receiving communities uh, uh, sort of viewing this or where were the, the institutions that were uh, in place. So housing markets, financial services, employment and economic development opportunities, healthcare provider capacity, and those social and cultural recreational facilities. And we're doing this in a comparative way, studying this against uh, Hurricane Katrina um, and, and the displacement that occurred in Houston, and then uh, a, a, group, a community in Louisiana as well. So we're very exciting. Uh, to do that, we're starting sort of the, the, the research because obviously uh, COVID threw a, a curveball in our research efforts in terms of that. But with that, I'm going to leave it uh, to Luis uh, to wrap up our presentation. So thank you all. Well, thank you, Fernando. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Santiago. I'm an associate professor at the University of Central Florida. Uh, but before that, I taught at the University of Puerto Rico for 15 years. So. Um, 
are we currently have an agreement with uh, the University of Puerto Rico, specifically the Coastal Research uh, and Planning Institute. And we are currently looking at the impact of erosion on coastal communities. And that includes physical measurements, but it also includes engaging relevant community stakeholders to know what is acceptable in terms of actions to protect them against the next uh, event, right? Uh, this all, of course, as, as Fernando mentioned, resulted from uh, Hurricane Maria. And as you probably know, um, quite a bit of the funding is just recently becoming available, especially CDBGDR funds. So there will be some funding available. And part of this current research is concerned with how do we distribute this funding in a socially equitable manner, um, especially along coastal communities. Um, so that's part of the current research. In terms of future work, I think one framework that I have always been interested in but have never been able to implement because it might be difficult to find funding for it is uh, integral ecology, the integral ecology framework, which is really very broad and overarching and includes, um, sorry about that. Um, it, it, it really considers climate, challenge, uh, climate challenges along three gradients. Um, the interior and exterior, the individual and the collective and the anthropocentric and ecocentric. So it's really trying to apply this overarching ecological framework to study where uh, knowledge from social sciences and humanities is essential. It's not just needed, but it's essential. So I think that's, that's about the time that we have. So thank you so much for, for inviting us to this. Thank you everyone from University of Central Florida. What a detailed presentation, it's great. Um, up next, we have Levi Romero presenting for the University of New Mexico and his colleague on behalf of his colleague as well, Michelle Hall-Kells. Buenos dias, buenas tardes otra vez. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background to kind of give you a sense of uh, where Michelle and I arrived at our proposed project. Uh, my degrees are actually in architecture. Um, and I worked in the profession for over 20 years and then began to gradually wean myself away from professional practice to teach full time at the university where I wound up teaching in the creative writing program for five years. And then from there I moved to the School of Architecture and Planning program and taught there for, oh, I think it was like another five years or so, uh, working with the SAP and with the Instituto de Agua y Cultura, their UNM branch in Taos, focusing on a secular and agrarian traditions of the upper Rio Grande bioregion. Uh, what I've done is to merge my two backgrounds, architecture and creative writing, and focus on cultural landscape studies in the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department, where I've been teaching since 2012. I'm also an affiliate faculty of UNM's Indigenous Design Planning Institute, where I've worked uh, with them on various projects in New Mexico, uh, Ecuador, and Central Mexico, working with indigenous communities. My collaborator on the Cross and Latino Laws project, um, as Wilmarie mentioned, is Dr. Michelle Howell Kells, Associate Professor in English at UNM in the Rhetoric Program. Um, we're focusing, of course, like everyone else, on climate change, but more specifically to the drought, la sequia, that we have been ex exponentially experiencing here in New Mexico for the past 40 years, if not longer. So I'm going to uh, read uh, from our uh, synopsis of our project titled Bendita Agua y Tierra Sagrada Climate Change Testimonios de la Nueva México. Project coordinators, Michelle Hall Kells and Levi Romero. Alignments. The alignment of the Crossing Latinidades Climate Pilot Project with our current work at the University of New Mexico centers around stories of stewardship, la cultura y la querencia, the environmental ethics of traditional cultures of New Mexico, and how the social values and material conditions of New Mexico rural communities are currently shaped by the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. 
The photos by Michelle Kells of Rio Riba County of the Seca Madre on the Brazos River in Terra Amaria, and by Levi Romero of the Embuda Valley of the longitudinal changes of the local Aseca system since 2018, maps the natural changes and cultural issues at stake in this current climate change moment with diminishing water supplies of the New Mexico Southwest watershed. We propose establishing a digital archive platform for the cultivation of a community writing and storytelling project that one, invites citizens and stakeholders of rural New Mexico communities to share their testimonials of the environmental and public health impacts of these current crises. Two, mentors local leadership of emerging community stewards in support of rural New Mexico student educational opportunities. And three, cultivates cross-institutional community conversations toward transformative action that promotes the preservation of traditional cultural practices and responds efficaciously to the rapidly changing environmental and public health conditions in local communities. Communities are teaching research, scholarship, creative projects, and community outreach public service endeavors extend across the state of New Mexico. My work sphere of engagement centers on the central region of the state in Albuquerque, where the site of UNM is the flagship institution of the state, all the way back to uh, my place of upbringing, my Querencia, the Embudo Valley, my ancestral homeland in Northern New Mexico. Professor Kell's sphere of engagement centers her efforts from Albuquerque where her initial research in Cold War Mexican civil rights activism began to Grant County in Southern New Mexico, the site of historic empire mine strike 1950-1953 where she continues research on the salt of the earth recovery project. Uh, the beneficiaries for our project uh, with current drought conditions in the Southwest and New Mexico facing 60% reduction in annual moisture levels due to climate change, the threat to local agro-pastoral communities extends across our region. The theme of our proposed project, Bendita Agua y Tierra Sagrada, Blessed Water, Sacred Earth, resonates deeply with heritage communities across the state. We wish to align our current efforts and this proposed Bendita Agua y Tierra Sagrada, Climate Change, Testimonios de la Nueva México, Digital Archive Project with the Crossing Latinidades Climate Pro Pilot Project to enhance the rhetorical resources, research opportunities, and leadership possibilities for first-generation rural New Mexico students at the University of New Mexico and their communities. We seek funding to support web design for the development of the Testimonios Digital Archive, community writing workshops and facilitators and oral history research assistants. And after watching and listening everybody's presentations, I'm so excited to be a part of this project. We have so much in common and uh, me da gusto, es una bendición, gracias. Thank you so much, Levi, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we're gonna go ahead and then move forward um, while your picture slideshow finishes. Um, next up, we will have uh, colleagues from the University of Texas at El Paso. So that is Patricia Juarez Carrillo and Jay Chakraborty. So let me just change the slide here for you. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Wilmary. Um, I don't know if uh, everybody sees me. Okay. I can see. Uh, my name is Patricia Juarez, and I am at the University of Texas at El Paso at the Chicano Studies Program and at the Center for Inter-American and Border Studies. Uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> the work that we have done in uh, regarding uh, climate change, uh, recently we collaborated with the University of Arizona uh, and um, deployed a survey in colonias in low-income communities in semi-urban areas in El Paso with 265 participants and we conducted three focus groups. Um, the great majority were Hispanic families. We went door to door to ask questions and to uh, organize focus groups in the patios and in the, in the parks uh, asking questions about what do they think about extreme heat? One of the things that I am 
just showing here, no, the, the, the previous one, the, the one of the things that I'm showing here is um, basic perceptions about heat. Uh, and it, uh, the, these perceptions align with what is being found in the entire nation, uh, that heat is uncomfortable, unbearable, but not a risk. Um, and, and some people feel stressed because here in the area we have the four seasons, but extreme heat is, is, is high and it's dry. And for these low income families, it's a burden. So when they hear that here comes a, a heat wave, they feel stressed because they don't know uh, either the house is not prepared or they don't know how to be prepared individually and do not have <clears throat> the adequate infrastructure in the neighborhood or in the home to deal with heat. Most of the people are, are checking the, the forecast in, in TV, but, but um, many of them say they cannot understand the information, speaking about urban heat islands and heat waves. We found in the focus groups that people think, as in the nation, that global warming, climate change is not part of their, they don't have a part in the solution. And also they cannot do anything. They, they seem uh, to feel that the risk is out there and it's, they don't feel self-efficacy uh, to do something about it. And they would like to know what to do at home, especially if it is something cheap and easy to do, and what to do when they feel sick as well. We found that some disparities in these in this, uh, participants uh, for example, that <clears throat> um, low-income families tend to turn off the AC uh, because they want to save on the electricity bill. Also, uh, here in the area, the evaporative coolers are very prevalent in, in rural and in, in, in low-income families, and these uh, evaporative coolers are not efficient during the summer with this heat. So getting a, a proper uh, um, um, air conditioner system is expensive for some families and water is a, a big issue in colonias and rural areas. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Women <coughs> tend to feel uh, <coughs> less empowered <coughs> to do changes at home because their husbands are the ones who do the decisions in terms of um, fixing the home to, to prepare for heat. The next one, please. So we developed um, <coughs> a curriculum to train the trainer uh, <coughs> to work <coughs> with community health workers. We have a manual that is bilingual uh, and has modules to teach the promotora, the community health workers, all about heat in the area, what are the common symptoms and what to do, and <coughs> most importantly, what are the vulnerable populations in terms of environmental justice, and, and what to do to mitigate heat impacts at the individual, household, and neighborhood level. This curriculum is teaching promotoras a step-by-step -step instructions on how to go to homes or conduct small charlas in the patios, in the parks, to teach families how to deal with extreme heat. Um, um, and we, this is available and it's for free. Now, the, the next speaker is my colleague, Jay Chakraborty. Hi, I'm uh, Jay Chakraborty. Uh, I'm a professor in the Sociology and Anthropology Department uh, at UTEP and also the director of the Social Environmental and Geospatial Analysis Lab for the past five years. And uh, I'm actually a geographer, my PhD degree is in geography, uh, who is interested in the spatial analysis of a wide range of environmental and social justice issues. <laughs> my slides kind of cover uh, two of my research interests that are relevant to this forum. Uh, next slide, please. 
the first one uh, is the vulnerability to climate related hazards and disasters. And uh, here's an example from a recent uh, National Science Foundation funded project that I was involved with on the unequal uh, social impacts of Hurricane Harvey in the greater Houston metro area. And our key data source or kind of a starting point for this work uh, was this uh, high resolution map layer uh, that we prepared through a massive collaborative effort that involved uh, FEMA engineers and their GIS analysts, as well as many local organizations. And it was kind of based on high water marks, you know, for after flooding that was compiled by the U.S. Geological Survey and, you know, working with several state, local and private sector sources. And we kind of use uh, this uh, data set with flood depth information uh, to estimate flood extent at the neighborhood level or census tract level, and which allowed us to compare to population and housing variables from the American Community Survey. And from an environmental justice kind of perspective, we found that uh, uh, the extent of flooding was significantly higher in neighborhoods uh, that contain a higher percentage of uh, percentage of Hispanics, non-Hispanic Blacks, as well as uh, those who are socioeconomically deprived based on index we had created using ACS data. And uh, this project also involved a fairly detailed uh, structured survey uh, of adults uh, who lived in the area you know, during and after uh, the hurricane. And that was conducted via cell phones in English and Spanish. And many of the survey questions were actually uh, based on a new protocol that was uh, devised by the CDC at that time uh, to document what they call uh, adverse event experiences following a natural disaster. And I have published uh, several articles from this work with colleagues at the University of Utah and again, one of the interesting findings uh, came out when we tried to uh, disaggregate the Hispanic category based on place of birth and citizenship info, you know, from a survey. And we did find uh, that uh, Hispanics were foreign born and non-citizens are more likely to suffer the worst of these negative or adverse even experiences compared to other Hispanic subgroups that we looked at. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my second area of interest focuses on the relationship between social vulnerability and exposure to extreme heat or heat waves. And this is something that I worked on with my former, well, now former PhD student, Bruce Mitchell, who did a lot of this work. And in our work, uh, we framed this as kind of a thermal inequity as a form of climate injustice. And although uh, most quantitative studies typically use land surface temperature as a proxy for heat, we try to expand this approach by including the effects of the built environment and excluding the mitigating effects of vegetation. So as you can see, we kind of developed this urban heat risk index uh, using values of uh, not just land surface temperature, but also NDBI and NDVI, and uh, which were obtained through remotely sensed imagery. And we kind of use this index as a dependent variable in our work to examine its relationship with wide variety of demographic and socioeconomic variables in many different study areas. And we found, I mean, the results were somewhat consistent in terms of, you know, some of the socially disadvantaged groups reside in areas with higher UHRI, but the patterns also depends on levels of racial and ethnic segregation in the study area, as well as historical growth patterns, you know, which is, uh, makes uh, or explains some of these differences. Uh, next slide, please. And again, speaking of urban heat, both Patricia and I uh, were involved uh, last year in uh, this urban heat island mapping campaign organized by the city of El Paso. And El Paso was actually one of 13 cities uh, nationally you know, chosen by uh, NOAA for their, what they call NIH, HIS, kind of community science initiative. And again, the goal here was to produce not just high resolution heat maps, which was the first part, but also to generate uh, locally viable solutions for mitigating uh, the impacts of extreme heat. And again, a highly collaborative project that involved partnerships with uh, not just the city, but also several other local community organizations. And also it was interesting to see almost close to 40 students uh, from our university, from engineering, social sciences, and many different backgrounds actually participated as uh, project volunteers and they actually drove on designated routes and collected the uh, temperature measurements on one of the hottest days of the year, you know, last July. And they did this like three times, morning, evening, and afternoon. So all this data collected has been uh, now used to produce this geographically detailed heat maps. 
but both Patricia and I are kind of in the process of planning the next steps, which involves more intensive community engagement, and as well as interviews uh, with residents in high risk areas to, with the goal, larger goal of uh, developing more effective adaptation and mitigation strategies. So I think that concludes our part of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And our contact information, I believe, is on the next slide. Thank you, Jay and Patricia, for your uh, presentation on heat islands and heat maps. Um, I'll leave this up for a moment, but our next um, group of presentations uh, is from the University of Illinois at Chicago. So we have Rosa Cabrera, Teresa Coldova, and Rachel Havelrock. Hello everyone, um, I'm director of the Rafael Cintron Ortiz uh, Latino Cultural Center at UIC, uh, better known as the LCC. And uh, my background is in cultural anthropology, uh, the visual arts and humanities, um, museum studies and Latin American and Latino studies. Um, I will start by sharing the work that provided a conceptual framework to engage students and communities uh, on the topic of environmental and climate justice at UIC. Um, let's see, next slide, Wilmarie. Um, so I was part uh, of a team of anthropologists at the Film Museum uh, that conducted ethnographic research for the City of Chicago Climate Action Plan. Uh, the research was done in nine Chicago uh, neighborhoods and the findings uh, revealed that an effective approach to engage communities in climate action uh, is to connect community concerns to environmental issues and identify local assets, including heritage traditions related to nature. Uh, for example, um, in Pilsen, a predominant Mexican and Mexican American neighborhood, people saw environmental issues in terms of local social justice, uh, such as the lack of green spaces uh, and neighborhood safety and accessibility to healthy food. Um, also uh, to decent housing and jobs and concerns about the legacy of air pollution uh, and attacks uh, on their cultural identity as immigrants. Uh, that research also revealed a series of cultural values and traditions um, they generated uh, many creative responses to environmental and climate challenges. For example, um, uh, you can see uh, in the images, uh, older immigrants had a transnational perspective on conserving resources uh, such as clean water and talk about the Sierra Leone. Uh, water conservation campaign in Mexico City uh, that was very famous in the 1970s. Uh, others talk about farming practices like raising chickens in their backyards and gardens, uh, that they were gro uh, growing things like uh, yerba buena, epazote, uh, and chiles. Uh, and the monarch was often illustrated in neighborhood murals and narratives to draw parallels between migration of the butterflies uh, and Mexican workers. Uh, the next slide. Um, so um, two key takeaways from that research in particular informed the development of the uh, UIC Heritage Garden. The first was the uh, cultural and social backgrounds of residents play large roles in shaping their attitudes and belief about climate change, nature, and the environment. And the second uh, was the gardening and urban agriculture in Chicago have been widely deployed to uh, uh, address community concerns and help mitigate the impact of uh, climate change and environmental hazards. So uh, the Heritage Garden um, uh, is a project, it's an internship uh, project that is run by the LCC uh, in collaboration with the other cultural centers at UIC. Uh, student interns come from diverse cultural backgrounds. Uh, many, are, many of them are immigrants or first generation born in the US, as well as first generation college students. Uh, and the goal uh, is to provide students with engaged learning activities to explore environmental and climate justice 
through an intercultural lens. Um, and throughout the year, um, you know, they sustain eight satellite gardens uh, on campus, including uh, the Monarch Habitat, which is uh, in front of the LCC. Uh, activities range from gardening and researching the cultural meanings of plants uh, to monarch conservation and tours of the garden. And through these activities, uh, what we're seeing is that, you know, students recognize uh, and help others see how social issues such as immigration intersect with environmental and climate issues. Um, and they use uh, the monarch uh, as a metaphor to talk about the movement of people across borders uh, intensified by climate uh, disasters and environmental pressures, um, you know, who are seeking a better life uh, on this side of the border. Um, the last slide, Wilmarie. And a second uh, project that I have been working on uh, is the Climates of Inequality Traveling Exhibition. Uh, this is a project of the Humanities Action Lab, uh, a coalition of universities across uh, the US and internationally partnering with environmental uh, and cultural organizations uh, on a national curriculum uh, and public memory project. Uh, the climate justice story from Little Village uh, was researched and developed by students in two courses that I taught in museums and exhibition studies. Uh, the students work with community partners Alianza America uh, and the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization who help uh, shape the local story alongside community members. Uh, we utilize the methodology of storytelling with objects and image to elicit stories. And you can see one group of residents uh, in a story circle there um, at Allianz Americas. Um, then, you know, the students ended up developing a digital archive with oral histories, video sounds and image. Um, and uh, based on there, they identified the major themes in the stories um, and created a series of infographics. Uh, I am showing two infographics at the bottom there, uh, and they use these tools uh, with community members to receive feedback uh, on the analysis that they have done. And you can kind of like see the students there in the middle uh, doing that. Um, you know, then finally, students use their analysis to create the different elements for the multimedia traveling exhibition and, and, and the web platform uh, featuring the local story of climate justice in Little Village. And the story of uh, Little Village um, situated in Chicago's third largest industrial corridor. Uh, it's a pretty complicated story where policing, uh, criminalization of migrants and land use for incarceration reveal how environmental uh, injustice and immigration intersects in this neighborhood. Um, I can put, this is all I have, and I can put the, uh, uh, the link to the exhibition on the chats uh, if you wanna check that later, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. So now we'll move on to Teresa. Hello, everyone. So very quickly, uh, I'm director of the Great Cities Institute here at UIC. And before I talk uh, about um, our environmental, our, our work around climate change, uh, let me say a couple of things about uh, Great Cities. We represent um, the university's commitment as an engaged university. And we do work that is uh, both um, where we produce re research reports on a number of topics, um, but also we do a lot of community-based practice work. And then uh, something else that we do is we convene people around key strategic conversations. So with that as a background, let me go ahead and go to the first slide. Um, our, our work really around climate change is really the intersection uh, between the pending climate catastrophe and environmental racism and how the two intersect. So um, that will be the theme of, of what I'll present here. But what I want to do, first of all, is just uh, show you some of the conversations that, that we have held uh, in bringing people together just to highlight a couple of points. Um, this first one on the Latinos environmental justice and climate change was with some folks from the National Resource Development Council. Uh, they had a Latino advocacy unit within there. And they were, they were really emphasizing and trying to make the point that Latinos do care about uh, the environment. So uh, I don't think they're so active right now within NRDC, but you can go to the website and see a lot of their, uh, a lot of the reports and the, and the 
uh, policy briefs that they put out there. Um, another, uh, we, we collaborate a lot, interface a lot with various environmental justice and climate justice activists um, throughout the country. So that one event, there are jobs for climate and justice, a worker alternative. Um, it, it was when we hosted Michael Guerrero, who is the executive director of the Labor Solidarity um, uh, labor, uh, for, for Sustainability. Uh, labor workers for solid for sustainability, and um, I really encourage you also to go to their website. One of the important themes, also in what we do, is making the, and what they do, of course, is making the connection between climate change, um, env environmental justice, and workers' issues, because so often these uh, these issues get framed as worker versus um, versus environment, or jobs versus the environment, and part of what the just transition phenomena is which comes out of the, or the concept which comes out of the environmental justice movement was to, was to make the point that we, we should not be separating or pitting jobs versus a environment against each other. Um, next slide. Michael Guerrero was his name, by the way. Um, another environmental ju uh, justice partner, climate justice partner that we have is, is folks from the Just Transition Alliance, um, and in particular, Jose Bravo, who's their executive director is someone that has uh, been part of conversations that we've had at Great Cities. Um, and one of the things that if you go to their site, Just Transition Alliance, he's based out of San Diego, but he's uh, it's a national organization and really he interfaces internationally and takes part in uh, issues, everything from Biden transition teams on the environment to international meetings on climate justice and so on. But if you go to their website, um, you will see, uh, actually a slide I'm gonna put up here in a minute, but you'll see this um, uh, an infographic that he put up uh, or a visual that he put up around uh, combating false solutions and climate policy. And I think it's a really important one because what they do there is they take on um, the idea that um, what gets put out as solution isn't necessarily a solution. Um, a big event that we had last year and, and, uh, and we'll be um, putting out a booklet actually because within the next month or so, and uh, Rachel Haverlock was part of this as well, is the idea of climate justice meeting global health. And so we had global health experts with environmental climate justice activists talking about the issues and what needs to be done about it. But we did it in the context of COVID. So we tied it to sort of how, you know, the, how viruses spread and so on. Um, next slide. Um, I mentioned that we do practice. So this is something uh, Rosa mentioned, the uh, Southwest side, a little village area, and actually that whole I-55 Southwest corridor is full of, in, of uh, contaminated abandoned sites, but also a growing uh, warehouse worker uh, site, um, where, which has, a, which with all its trucking and, uh, and um, toxic fumes has a lot of, of, of issues there that, that, that they're taking on. Um, but this one here is focused on the Southeast side, which again has a lot of the abandoned heavy industrial activity. So we worked with community groups uh, to produce this planning framework. Um, and uh, so if you can go to our website and, uh, and find this, this document, but it's a really powerful document that, lay, that takes the vision of the community and ties it to a whole slew of recommendations. It lays out also time framework but it's very specific and basically the idea is that there's gonna be development in this area. Here's some of the issues that need to be thought about. Um, next slide. So this is, um, um, this is a, a couple of excerpts from that plan. Um, you'll see there's some uh, guiding principles. Some of these are excerpts from the People of Color Summit, um, but, uh, but our work there was really to point out what are some of the environmental health issues that, that continue to persist and, uh, and that need to be dealt with by the city because when these companies left, they just up and left and, and didn't really clean up behind them. So there's a lot of, of mitigation that needs to be done. Um, next slide. So this is a just transition. So again, this is an important uh, concept because it, again, it comes out of the uh, environmental justice movement and it was a way to counter this idea that we should be paying jobs versus environment. And we still hear this. Um, constantly, right? Well, we can't protect the environment because it takes away jobs or people aren't gonna want us to do this because it takes away jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of our, our um, uh, the Just Transition Alliance is really to take that on. So one of the things to end here very quickly with a project that then we are working on, uh, is interfacing uh, or collaborating with 
not only an uh, organizer from the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization that, that Rosa referenced, but also from the Just Transition Alliance, we are taking on the issue of how um, um, planning, for example, the ways in which um, uh, the field of planning, for example, has enabled land use infrastructure design and economic development practices that shape the very conditions that are leading to, the, to not only environmental racism, but uh, climate change. And so the kinds of things like fossil fuel activity, for example, the use of chemicals, the various forms of contamination, the very things that our communities are being exposed to uh, in concentrated forms in, in environmental justice communities are the things that are also uh, really uh, exacerbating, contributing to, and largely affecting um, the um, uh, climate change. And so we really have a very intimate connection between the notion of environmental racism and climate change. And what we are in the process of doing then is, is uh, starting this project, uh, and well, we, we're into it, looking at land use plans and approval process, approvals of plans, planning practices, uh, design, placement of infrastructure, economic development activities, uh, all in the context of a global economic system to look at the ways in which those things are both fueling environmental racism and climate change and what it is that needs to be done to, to shift the kinds of planning practices and policies that are actually exacerbating both climate change and environmental racism. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up and pass to Rachel. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Haverlock and at UIC, I run something called the Freshwater Lab, which is focused largely on water issues in the Great Lakes watershed. In the context of climate change, many politicians and uh, Chicago and Great Lakes boosters speak about our position as relatively stable amidst climate change. And so Chicago, the Great Lakes region, is touted as a climate refuge. Well, you don't become a climate refuge just by leaving things as they are. Um, indeed, we do have the geographic advantage of a relative abundance of water, as well as the history of various uh, waves of migration. Um, uh, spurred by labor moving to the region. Um, but we have to look at the kind of extant systems that we have and appraise how our communities might survive and thrive amidst climate change and where there has to be pretty dramatic intervention and exactly as Rosa and Teresa were speaking about transformation of our existing systems. Will Marie, thanks for the next slide. One of the things that the Freshwater Lab does is work in the mode of digital storytelling. I'd like to introduce all of you to our Backward River project at thebackwardriver.org. I'm speaking here as a team member. Uh, I have a team of 10 people. You can see their names and pictures and biographies on the website. So let me focus here on why we call the Chicago River also known as the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, also known as the Chicago Area Waterway System, why we call it the Backward River. Well, very literally speaking, this is a river that was reversed at the dawn of the 20th century by the Army Corps of Engineers. It was reversed for two purposes. One, to send the growing, swelling waste of a metropolis to the global south. Yes, um, colleagues from the west and south, you heard that right. Chicago's waste ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, where it helps to fuel a dead zone that has now reached the size of the state of New Jersey. Not only is this literally a river that runs backward, but we find that the kind of infrastructure planning and distribution of resources are themselves um, rather backward. And I hope that this backwardness is illustrated in the following graphic. 
Uh, because historically and accelerated in the present, we see two trends along this waterway system. We see the public subsidy for industry, for the movement of fossil fuels um, by the barge industry, but we also see public subsidy going into the development of amenities and condos that serve a mostly wealthy, um, mostly white demographic. At once, we see the um, development of industrial corridors. Uh, much to say about this, but while the slide is here, I just want to make a singular point. All those industrial corridors follow patterns of both environmental and infrastructural racism. These are places where industry, um, quite frankly, follows different codes of engagement. Uh, the best way to illustrate this, I think, is that along the Chicago area waterway system, there is a completely different water quality standard for the water that flows through industrial corridors. Uh, the reason that this uh, goes to the heart of our dialogue today is because historically and, and at present, um, the population in and along industrial corridors in the Chicago area is mostly black, brown, and indigenous. Well, Marie, thanks for the, the next slide. The, um, the other thing that, um, that we think about in assessing this waterway system um, are questions of sovereignty. Um, we uh, had groups that Rosa and Teresa mentioned, such as the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, grassroots groups during the Obama administration uh, shut down coal power plants in their neighborhoods. And there was a lot of engagement and a lot of study, a lot of community-based work about the kind of just transition that people in the communities um, wanted to see. And yet the larger trends are a kind of digging into patterns of pollution and discrimination such that disparities are reproduced again and again, exactly as we heard from Teresa. Uh, in place of these coal power plants, we are now seeing the construction of warehouses, those opaque buildings where workers do not have a, a sovereignty and say over their labor and where diesel trucks bring the same levels of, um, of air pollution. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at once, here's just a glossy rendering of um, one of these sites along the Chicago River where the taxpaying public uh, somehow is funding um, $1 billion to construct um, glassy condos and, um, and office buildings as the polluting industries um, don't change their practices, are simply moved and redirected into Chicago's industrial corridor. Next slide, please. Um, okay, um, so uh, here you see in the photo uh, something that we must commemorate. Uh, it happened one year ago. Um, the uh, Crawford Coal Power Plant, which again was shut down through grassroots community organizing, um, was demolished on Easter weekend. Uh, literally bombing uh, Chicago's most densest neighborhood with toxic fumes amidst a respiratory pandemic. So I'll just leave this here as um, both, I think, an illustration of the kind of backward uh, planning and policy going on along the Chicago area waterway system and this question of how in um, post-industrial cities along the Great Lakes that are positioned, right, to really be leaders uh, in the Anthropocene, right, where are the points of intervention? The problem is not at the community level where organizing, engagement, communication is um, very well planned and quite frankly, very inspiring, but how do we intervene 
in these structures of inequality in uh, the age of accelerated climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel and, and Will Marie um, for wrapping the presentations up for us. And thank you to all the educators and researchers presenting today and sharing your thoughts, research, ideas with all of us so that we may continue to bring an essential focus as the UCF scholars reminded us on climate change across disciplines, universities, and communities. Um, as a reminder for everyone, please know uh, that all the questions and comments were collected from the chat and will be answered at a later time. Um, now, uh, as we near the end of our time together, I have the privilege to introduce two poets from Kumba Links, a local Chicago-based collaborative that describes itself as a family of arts facilitators and youth participants. Please use the chat to welcome our Kumba Links poets, Vanya Luna and Mahogany Brown. Hello, thank you, Jorge, for the introduction, and thank you, Will Marie, and the entire team um, behind this, and for having us, um, and Vanya as well. Um, we're going to be presenting a poem entitled Mother Earth. Mother Earth, a corroded color girl, access pipelines waiting in her waters, iron friction in flint faucets from faulty futures for Black families. Colonialism aims to sacrifice the sacred for profit. Dances on diasporic collarbones chaining her resistance in capitalist residue. She burns back in California, burns black and brown. A reminder that when the native people of this land are stripped of their autonomy to care and tend for her, she will burn everything down in their name. Profits prevent ceremony because it doesn't bring capital. The tarring of black Bronx lungs, wheezing in sync, emitting rhythm, even in despair, even in disparity. We can't breathe proverbs prophesied in polluted poverty. Pig patrol bring asthmatic chokeholds and bait trucks. She is no stranger to choked out testimony. They tried cutting off her ecological airwaves. Comed tried cutting her lights off last week. Like she ain't a luminescent solar sister. Like she don't create renewable energy from her own body, offering us the medicine needed for her wounds. She braids rice into opportunity, plotting resilience in nappy kitchenettes, sowing seeds for a future green enough to grow in, overcrowded by love and hot comb flinches, burns at the roots, silk pressing binaries and unpaid bills. She practices being boundless, borderless, a Katrina wash and go, breaking levees and glass ceilings in the same breath. When you cage her children, she breaks those too. Stealing land and people is a violation of a mother's love. So we gather, organizing is ceremony. This love in nature is sacred like a mother in birth. Liberation dilates. She pushes us to protect her through canals carrying ancestors to freedom. We descend from our mother knowing this fight is our birthright. Fighting for the land is fighting for the people. So we gather, postpartum, prepare to plant our placenta back into her. In Michoacan, when our babies are born, traditionally we bury our umbilical cords back into the land so we can always find a way back home. This is our first lesson, that the earth is mother, is home, is our duty to defend her, defend her like Berta Caceres, Harriet Tubman, Leah Penniman, Dolores Huerta, Asada Shapur, Hanani Kaitra, Comandante Ramona, Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Reparation, Sovereignty. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing your words and um, art with us and providing uh, us a space to reflect along with you as you uplifted some of the women in your piece. Um, and shout out to Kumba Links for being a huge part of the Chicago creative community. Um, to be conscious of time and to bring today to a close, I mentioned earlier that we have an artist from Ink Factory who has been creating, creating live visual notes today to visually represent the key concepts and themes of our conversation. Allison will uh, be sharing her, uh, their screen so you can all take a look at the illustration boards they've developed. Um, and we can all take a look. As we take a moment to view the illustration boards, um, I, I invite Dr. Ralph Sintron, who will provide us a closing remarks to bring our first part of today's symposium to a close.
Uh, thank you again, Jorge. Um, listening to these, um, listening to the amount of work that's going on uh, at the different universities, uh, the not only the amount of work, but the range of work, um, there's something like really, 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 really exceptional, you know, from anthropological analyses of beach pebbles to um, mapping heat waves, um, you know, to thinking about green infrastructure and so on, uh, to obviously uh, the work going on in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, with regard to Coast Maria and certainly um, rising sea levels uh, and so on. Um, it's really quite, um, quite exceptional. Uh, I think in terms of time, we're supposed to be wrapping things up. Um, literally, we've already kind of overgone our time. So we're supposed to be returning at 12.55. Um, in terms of the smaller cohort. So let me say that the public part of our presentation uh, is ending. Uh, and now for the cohort, for the speakers and for the universities uh, that have been doing this work, uh, the second part uh, will be starting. Uh, and we'll be getting together, I believe at uh, one o'clock so I'm going to say thank you so much to everyone uh, who uh, decided that there would be something interesting to hear. Um, I certainly look forward and I think everyone that was listening will look forward to see um, how the Crossing Latinidades um, consortium work uh, will continue. So we will be in touch with each other, uh, speaking to those folks who were listening um, I would not be at all surprised if you have an interest, uh, for instance, in uh, perhaps your own university uh, talking some more to the cohort that has already been established. Um, if that should be true, then you might contact uh, Will Marie, uh, you might contact me. And so I do want to say, by the way, that Will Marie and Rosa are the ones who really have organized how the how today's um, how today's meeting uh, would go. So a special applause to those two in particular. Um, so I think it's best to sign off at this point, um, and we will be meeting the different universities, the cohorts, the second part at one o'clock. So thank you so much for listening to us, um, and we look forward to further work. So see you soon. Bye-bye.